uh, I invite uh, all of you to get seated so we can start. And this is a, a session that is being live streamed. So a big warm welcome to our online viewers. Um, please engage during this session. We are going to start um, the, the session on data discourse, data privacy and open data, getting to coexistence. There's no need for me to articulate why this topic is so important. Just from the Twitter activities in the past two days after we, after we announced this uh, event, you can see how much people are really uh, sharing uh, the information and then gearing up towards uh, uh, joining us for this. I really very much hope this is going to be a lively conversation, if not a fierce debate, between two of our global thought leaders. One is Jenny, who is the ex uh, CEO of the Open Data Institute, and another is Gus Hossein, who is the executive director of uh, Privacy International. They appear to be sitting on the two extremes of this continuum where we're talking about, but let's see where they converge. At the same time, this is also a discourse, a conversation between Gus and, and Jenny, as well as you. So I would really invite you, especially the online viewer, viewers, to uh, submit your questions. So we will try to um, respond through um, a discussion during our Q&A. And also um, our colleagues uh, in the audience who can be prepared and then come forward to the mic to offer your comments and, and uh, raise your questions. You can also follow us um, on the, um, online under the hashtag data day. So with that, let's start. I will just uh, throw you to right into your conversation, and then we will come back. Thank you very Thank you. much, Aisha. Um, so yes, we, we were set up, really, to try and have an argument in front of you around uh, uh, the open data or privacy, because they are obviously mutually exclusive. Um, we thought that so we've we've planned a, a kind of a, a discussion various topics that we want to explore that we think are going to be interesting and um to kick us off i thought that we should start with really describing what it is that we see if i can have my slide there we go um what we see in terms of a vision what is it that we actually want to get to um so you know for, from a open data perspective. What is it that we want to see? Well, we want to see data being, being used for decision making. Um, from an open data perspective, we have a very strong belief that decision making isn't just about policy makers, right? It isn't just about data, for example, as we've been talking about, coming into the World Bank, being used to direct aid, but it's also about people on the ground being able to use data people in governments, people in local government, people in communities, individuals being able to make decisions day by day that improves their lives, businesses being able to know where to invest, how to, how to scale. Um, and we have, like, for, from our perspective, a very strong belief that um, those decisions should be made by lots of people, that the same data can inform a whole bunch of those decisions. And that if you have uh, lots of people making those kinds of decisions, they need lots of support. You need lots of products and services and applications and, and um, intermediaries that can take data and explain it to people that can help them to reach those decisions. And that that in itself is a great source of economic growth and innovation and other good things that we want to see in the world. Um, so uh, this, this diagram kind of shows for, from an ODI perspective, we want to get to that positive impact from data. We want lots of people to be making decisions over the top of it and lots of people creating amazing products and services to get us there. What's your vision, Gus? Well, I, I'm the elephant in the room, according to Penny. Um, the, it, it's, I was daunted to come into this room because often the, the privacy perspective is the, the impediment, the one that stands in the way of the great work you're doing to eradicate and respond to, um, to poverty, for instance. 
And so when we were playing this talk, um, we thought, well, I, actually, why don't we use ODI's fantastic theory of change, their graphics about theory of change? Because we want, as privacy advocates, we want all the same things. We're afraid of the same things as well. The, the fundamental difference, and it's not even a, a, a contest, the fundamental difference for us is that um, we want people to be in control of their data. So you want data to be generated and used and made available. We just throw the rights framework at the question and say, well, these human beings who are generating the data, they have rights. And that right, those rights include the right to be informed and in control, to have a say around what data ends up where and how it's used. And so we ultimately want to get to a destination where individuals are capable and communities are capable of using their own data for their own purposes and getting access to other data sets to inform their daily lives and for that data to also get to where it needs to be. But then to link it with what was discussed this morning and uh, what made me somewhat wet reticent is that uh, the eradication of poverty arguments I'm hearing are the exact same arguments I hear from the national security sector when they say that they must have this, this break glass emergency, all laws must disappear in the face of what's needed for national security. And for what it's worth, the law exists for that, for the most part. We contest and we occasionally sue uh, an intelligence agency here or there on those questions, but there are legal and constitutional frameworks. What's interesting about this moment we have right now and this debate between us and this, this discussion at the World Bank as you're thinking going forward, and hopefully I'll be invited back on the 12th of February uh, next year, that we can push for that legal framework everywhere. So yeah, we want to get there, but we want to do so under a, a fair and lawful regime that respects the fact that people have rights. Right. I think one of the other, the other pieces that we had as part of the discussion has been a part of the discussion in the open data community, and I think it's, it, it has a similar piece here, is the, and it was touched on earlier actually, was the degree to which you kind of start from we've got data that's already being collected, that's already, um, you know, we already have it in our hands, let's see what we can do with it. Um, and that kind of, that attitude of um, open by default, let's make sure that the data that we have is uh, open for people to, to reuse. Um, and then we've been having a debate in, in, the, in the open data community, as I say, about is, is that the attitude that we should take or should we be taking something that is a bit more top down? Um, so we have these questions that we want answered or these decisions that need to be made or this facilitation and coordination that needs to happen. Can we work backwards from that to what data needs to be collected and made available? Um, and I think you have similar kinds of things around, uh, around constraining what data gets collected to, to what's needed. Yeah, and, and so we can have the abstract conversations about uh, you know, what should a framework look like? What kind of data do you think you actually need in order to conduct what it is you're doing? But we exist in the, in, since the bottom up mm -hmm. where um, we know the data that's being generated to some degree. We know the, the politics at play. We know that a census is not a neutral artifact in a lot of countries, including right here, when it comes to do we add immigration data to, uh, to a census, or school censuses, uh, whether it's in the United Kingdom or in Greece, where do we add immigration data to there. These are the political decisions that are being made that are relatively distant from the abstract discussions around, oh, should we have data yeah. or should we not have data? And we need to make sure we reflect those sensitivities and those challenges. Right. So, it's, it, so part of that is it's, it's all very contextual. Like the, the, the answers in any particular situation are based on that situation. Exactly. Let's move on to, to some of the threats that we, see, that we see happening. So we've already had reference, I think, on the panel to data being seen as oil, that, that metaphor of, of uh, data as oil 
I, I think leads to this mentality where we see data as being extremely, uh, extremely valuable, that, that therefore organisations have a tendency to want to hoard it and hoard that value to themselves. They think that that's the way in which you unlock the, the, the value of information. Um, and what we see happening in the world are these, is these kind of ver real uh, vertical constrained data flows where it's the same organisation collecting data, um, analysing it, and then choosing what uh, like results of those analyses get actually shared with people. And that happens in the private sector. Um, it happens in the public sector. You get this very kind of this, this pipe. And I think that that's a real... Th I, I think that that stops more people from making, being able to make decisions and it stops more of that kind of economic growth from, from products and services that can be made on data. Yeah, no, exactly. And so to, to be somewhat controversial, um, one of the problems we had in say in 2012 and 2013 was the, the privacy discourse was getting away from us. Like we, we weren't able to contest in a debate around open data, um, all the value that you brought to the world. Um, and, and the promise of big data. And the, the, there was a move in the discourse around all these issues to stop talking about collection and just start talking about use because big data is all about the, the, the three Vs and there's so much data, let's just use it. And then things started to fall apart with, in the data world. And it was that what we call data exploitation uh, you have as that mining activity. And that was when we discovered that intelligence agencies were accumulating vast amounts of data without anybody having any knowledge. Then it wasn't long afterwards we started to realize that the Googles and the Facebooks were accumulating vast amounts of data, not the data you actively give them, but they were collecting vast amounts of me metadata below that. And that started to get people to think, actually, maybe we have to focus on the, on the question of collection. Maybe we have to start focusing on the power of these institutions. And if data protection law and constitutional law wasn't enough to stop intelligence agencies and to stop Facebook and Google, now we're seeing a really interesting debate emerge around competition law right. or um, uh, not quite laws, but rules around artificial intelligence and the use of, of AI systems. That might be the next generation of protections we need if we weren't getting anywhere with data protection law and constitutional law, which I'm not willing to give up. But the reality was, and the reality is, these companies and these governments are doing very well for themselves right now. Yeah. And in, in some ways, then, the, the oil analogy is a, is a useful one because, of course, we know that um, exploiting oil has these ter terrible kinds of uh, effects on our environment and on, on people and we don't, that, um, that aren't recognised or felt by the organisations that are exploiting, exploiting that. Um, what do you make of the... the the debate that, that we've heard this morning around um, use of data that is being collected by these private sector organisations kind of for public good. Does that, is that a way of breaking, uh, of, well, you know, this data is being collected anyway. Is that the way in which we get a more public good out of it? Yeah, it's, um, I've been working with the humanitarian sector for about 10 years on these types of questions. and. We did a report last year with uh, ICRC because ICRC approached us and said, hey, we work in very difficult circumstances. We want to reach out to our beneficiaries. How should we communicate with them? Should we develop our own app? Should we use Facebook Messenger? Should right. we be using iMessage, but nobody can afford iPhones? Um, WhatsApp and Signal and all these various messaging platforms. And so we decided to contact the companies and ask the companies, okay, if, if, these systems are used, what data do you generate? What data do you understand about the user? So if somebody who's seeking assistance from ICRC contacts ICRC on Facebook, what does Facebook now know about this? And so we wrote to all the companies, and um, we gave them a good amount of time to respond, and not a single company responded. And it was about a month later when the Cambridge Analytica Facebook story broke. And that shifted everything. All of a sudden, uh, even in ICRC, they were waking up to the challenges here. But one of the stories you might have missed on, on the Cambridge Analytica Facebook 
debacle uh, was um, Facebook was using its app on older Android phones to collect call data. So it's one thing for Facebook to collect the data that you give Facebook. It's another thing for Facebook to collect data on, say, geographic location when you're using that app. But that app was digging into the operating system to collect all the data of people's phone calls. And so to, that's a long route to, the, to answer your question. If you really want to have access to this data that these wonderful companies have, and it has incredible utility for you, first ask, what's the provenance of this data? Should they even have this data to begin with? And then second, if you say yes to that, you've made my life a lot harder. Because if I have to tell those companies, you shouldn't have that data. That data's not yours. You didn't even ask people for that data. They're going to turn around with their, their image that they've laundered through their great cooperation with you to say, but we can't stop collecting this data. Look how it's eradicating poverty. They're not going to talk about how they're also using it for targeted advertising and so on and so forth. But that's the discourse challenge we have going forward. Yeah. So that ties into some of the, um, the way in which we think of, of data as, is as being this new form of infrastructure. It's a, uh, so we often use the analogy of, of roads as, as, as being like data. Just as roads get you to a destination, data gets you to some decisions or some insights that, that you can make. And um, you know, we choose where, we, we choose in some places what roads we build. In other places, they, they just arise. Um, those roads get owned by different kinds of organizations. Sometimes they're publicly owned. Um, sometimes we have public access. Sometimes they, you have to go through a toll booth. Um, but, but when we become reliant on particular roads, then that, that, it, but then that is, it's our infrastructure, and it, it's just there. And we can't change it or get rid of it. It's the same with, with data. Once we're, once we're reliant on data from a particular source, um, that, then how can you go back? How can you change that? What does that do for competition? What does that do for the, uh, for, for, as you say, changes to the, the, of what gets collected? And so I think that we have to be really thoughtful about how we create that data infrastructure, what that data infrastructure should be looking, should look like, who should be owning it, who should be, who should be able to have access to and, it. And to pick up exactly on that point with one of the examples that was used this morning about putting CCTV in schools to detect um, uh, teachers' attendance, um, if you look at one actual deployment about, uh, of this type of system I was reading about last night by, in the report by the fantastic um, NGO called AI Now, who are probably the experts on AI systems in civil society. You really should read their uh, report from December. They, uh, they talk about a system that was built, I believe it was in Kenya, with the assistance of uh, Microsoft, that they put cameras in the classroom, but they were detecting um, micro expressions from the kids. Mm. So these systems aren't just put in there to detect coming and goings and basic data. The, the, the excitement of that exploitation model is that what additional data can we glean? What intelligence can we build off that? And can we decide if kids are happy or sad at any moment in time? That's the world that these people are building. It's not us instructing them, oh, please put one CCTV, yeah. just f focusing on the teacher. It is a completely different model because they want that data and they want to do plenty with that data. Interesting. So let's move on to the, the next slide. So this, this is a, a visualization that we use at, at ODI in order to describe like, different kinds of levels of access to data that we, um, data might be personal, it might be commercial, it might be from government, um, but, but uh, you, you, can, you can look at what kinds of level of access you can, you can get to it. So on one side, I always forget when I'm facing this way, yeah, on the left, then you have closed data uh, that is just uh, available within a particular organization. On the other side, on the right, you have open data, which is available for everyone to access and use and to share. Um, and then you have this big kind of gray area in the middle where there's different kinds of sharing arrangements where, where uh, you might have a specific arrangement with a particular organization. You might have stuff that is available on the web for scraping. And technically, you know, you, you shouldn't be using that because it's got the, the copy, copyrighted and, and you haven't got permission to do that, but people do. 
Um, and, and we talk about trying to make data now as open as possible. So moving it as much as we can to the right of that, of that spectrum. Um, sometimes that means making data completely open, but sometimes it just means making it more accessible through some constrained, secure, uh, well-governed kinds of arrangements for particular purposes, for example, for, for research purposes. Um, or we also talk about like being able to give individuals and communities and organizations access to data that is about them in those kinds of constrained ways. So rather than that kind of viewing open data as just being, you know, it's either open or it's, or it's closed, that kind of open, which I think open by default sometimes leads us to, we talk about data being as open as possible and that being uh, really important. What do you think? Well, this, um, this slide is the hardest one for me, um, for, and I'll, I'll give two reasons. First, um, a fundamental tenet of, of privacy law, and to some degree data protection, is that uh, you have to specify the purpose for which you're collecting the data. And so at the time of asking the individual, or at the time of data collection, you have to articulate why it is you need this data. But then this spectrum comes up and says, oh, we can repurpose the data. We can use it for other innovative reasons, which has got all those great ideas and, and, and innovations that go on top of that. But it breaks the fundamental rule. But that's where data protection law comes in and says, OK, well, look, you must specify purpose, but you are allowed to share. You are allowed to do further processing on that data, but you must be clear. Or the get out of jail free card is the data must be anonymized. Often people confuse de-identification with anonymization. De-identification is really easy. You just kill a, a column in a spreadsheet, um, but it doesn't work versus anonymization, which is incredibly hard to do, incredibly hard to prove. And with every open data set that gets released into the, into the wild, it becomes harder to prove that what you've done is work on an anonymous data set. But nonetheless, you can do those types of things. But that, that's only the first challenge. The second challenge with this spectrum is that as an advocacy organization who has to deal with governments and companies coveting data and building systems that generate more data, those are basically on the, on the left. I want to know what's going on in these systems. I want to know about procurement. I want to know the security standards. And lo and behold, I can't get access to any of those things unless we sue the agencies or we seek legal action against the companies. That's an extraordinary world we're creating where we want this progressive ideal of openness around data. And again, we share that goal. And you have a buy-in from industry and government saying, yeah, no, we want to open data too. But they don't want to be open about it themselves. Yeah, so there's a, I think this, and we heard it, we heard it today, I think, earlier. Um, this role to play about how to, how to um, articulate where data should be on that spectrum, how to say what the right place is for it. So, you know, transparency around what data gets collected or transparency around even personal data like uh, MPs' expenses in, in the UK. Um, we would view that as something that, as a society, we decide that that should be, that should be open because we, we need to have that transparency for accountability purposes or, or whatever. Um, and then we have this, this piece in the, in the middle about where we've got that more sensitive data, which, as you say, you, you, can't, you, um, you can't share uh, uh, individual level data without revealing something about individuals, even if you strip away identifiers. So you have to put other technological and governance mechanisms around how, th how that gets shared. Um, 
We, the, the talk earlier was talking about uh, data collaboratives a, as a mechanism, and in, in the UK at ODI, then we've been exploring using data trusts as a mechanism. So, you know, the idea of having a, an independent third party organisation who is the organisation that, that stewards data, that data is donated into that organisation and it is, is given the, the rights and the, the powers to be able to decide who gets access under what circumstances and I think does all of that in a way that is is for um, a, a named set of beneficiaries right for a particular for a particular good and in consultation with them so we I think we have to recognize these kind of nuances in, in, in this gray kind of sharing of data space where in order to get the really good stuff out of data in order for it to be used as as, as much as possible Obviously, some of that can't be open, but what are the mechanisms we put in that middle bit that, that help us to get that more trustworthy data, data access? Absolutely, and I think uh, you, you had rightly identified the governance question. So to use a few examples, um, we, we already heard Uber and other ride-sharing companies are sharing data with cities. It's often with cities where they have legal challenges. So Uber offered to London a data right. set after London came this close to banning Uber. It's almost like a negotiating card in the politics of data. Um, but a, a, a slightly older example of that is um, the GPS company TomTom. Uh, it's a GPS for, uh, for car drivers, essentially. They, in 2011, they uh, shared aggregate data with the Dutch police. And that aggregate data allowed the Dutch police to identify where they should be putting speed traps. And when TomTom Tom customers found out, <laughs> they were outraged, but TomTom Tom said, oh, but we've anonymized the data. And they said, we don't want you to use our data to create intelligence for the police, <laughs> arguably to target us. Um, and so who gets to have a say when, again, data protection law would normally say, oh, well, we have nothing to do here because it's anonymous, yeah. but there are still strong ethical questions. Similarly, we saw examples of um, Google and geolocation data and mapping, and most people would say, well, that's really good. But when Baidu does it, they are offering ideas around um, they, to study crowd formation or to predict unrest. <laughs> what draws the line between what, can Google do that? Well, Google certainly can do that. Is Google doing that? Well, they're not telling us. But Baidu has the same amount of data, and they're able to do, and they were actually talking about doing it. Mm. Um, yeah, so it's, it's like, who's going to govern, and where are you going to draw those right, lines? Right. And can people still contest? Right. And one argument that, that we make quite a lot at ODI is that you know, there's, there's all this amazing data that is held in private hands, and we want it to be used for public good. So actually, we're seeing trends, particularly in, in the EU, where um, th there's a greater kind of uh, um, willingness to say, actually, this private data should be used, should be able to be grabbed by government for you. So in, in the UK, the Digital Economy Act um, gives the Office of National Statistics the right to get hold of administrative data. So for example, um, transactions at particular supermarkets in order to uh, get a better, get better retail price index information. Um, so you see that kind of uh, that growing trans uh, potential transfer of data from private sector into public sector, and kind of that works in places where you trust public sector, or, or you see it in the bank here, right? From private sector into the bank to then make decisions on. But what happens if you don't trust those organisations to whom it is being to, to whom it's being transferred? And to use the UK as an example. The UK government's very excited always about data sharing. And it just so happens their most popular data sharing regime is what they call a hostile environment, where they want various government departments to report to essentially the immigration authority to say, yeah. what, what do you know about people who might not be here illegally? This is not why, like data protection law is designed specifically to avoid that kind of data sharing. Right. But again, the politics of data always gives rise to these types of situations. So let's move on to, the, for, to this next slide. So this, this is another kind of scenario that we get worried about, which is that you know, we, we have all of these 
concerns about how people have all of these concerns about how data might be misused and used against their interests um, and their legitimate concerns right that this, this happens in the world but what we get worried about is that if those if we get too much worry about that that people start to avoid data collection they start to avoid they they withdraw consent for data being used um, and, and it can be um, people, it can be governments, it can be communities withdrawing that kind of consent. Or they start lying and you get corruption of data. Um, so there was a great article in the uh, Wall Street Journal recently about um, the insurance companies starting to be able to get access to um, social network data in order to understand you know, what, what the insurance premium should be for people. And there was a set of recommendations for what people should do about this. And it was, you know, don't get yourself, don't have a selfie taken smoking. Um, don't do videos of yourself uh, engaging in extreme sports, right? Because those are going to drive up your premiums. I, I thought it was really amusing. It wasn't, you know, don't smoke. It wasn't don't engage in extreme sports. It was just don't record yourself doing that. Um, so, but that... But that leads to this corruption of data, right? It, when, when we think that data is being used to, to make those kinds of decisions about us, we, uh, we react. We, we do something different. We, we fill in different names on the forms to access Wi-Fi. And we, we do these things in order to subvert data collection that we don't agree with. Just to pick up on your example of the insurance, though, um, a year ago, a car insurance company in the UK announced it was going to get access to Facebook data to make uh, uh, decisions on young people's car insurance. And it had nothing to do with the data you knowingly gave. So it, it wasn't about controlling what images right, right. you actually post. What they were going to do is they were going to analyze your use of language. So if I said, Jenny, let's meet up tonight, and Jenny responded on Facebook, yes, let's meet at 8, Jenny would actually get a lower, uh, lower cost insurance. Than me, because I'm evasive. I don't commit to a specific time. But she was so diligent <laughs> to commit to a specific time. And when Facebook realized that they'd signed off on this, they killed it within an hour of the media furore. But again, this is not about the data that you knowingly have control over. This is the data below that's being judged. Mm. You can't stop, like, you, sure, you can not post a photo, but they're looking below. And just to slightly move, this di discussion, because if, if, if you don't agree with anything I'm saying, that's fine, we can move on. Just, just pretend this presentation started right here, right now. Take one thing away from my contribution today, and it's around this issue, and that is securing data is hard. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. Essentially, the best way to keep data safe is to not collect it in the first place. And I know that sounds Ridiculous, but I, I swear to you, this is the only thing I want you to take away. In the past year, Google had a breach so bad that they shut down their social networking. Um, I want to say service, but it wasn't very good anyways. But they shut it down because the breach was so bad. Facebook had a breach of its identity infrastructure on the scale of millions of people. Now, I don't mean to be mean to these companies. Actually, I know the security engineers at the, these companies. They are the best of the best, and yet they still have security challenges. So never listen to a claim to say, oh, but we can collect the data and it will be kept secure. It's interesting, nobody talked about security so far this mm -hmm. morning. We talked about the opportunities, the sharing, the use, but we didn't talk about the security. And if this data is so valuable to shape decision making, then it's going to be valuable to somebody else. And so we work across the world, we, we work with partners in uh, about 17 countries across the world, and they look at what's going on in their countries to the, to the extent that they can understand. Because at least in, the, in Euroland, where there's the uh, general data protection regulation, there's a duty on companies to report when they've had a breach. And uh, I saw some data last week saying that there were 66,000 such reports to regulators over the past year in Europe. To find out about breaches in other parts of the world, well, they don't happen. They just, the, the breaches, no, they must have perfect security of all their systems everywhere in the world because you never hear about problems. Except occasionally a few stories leak. Like last year alone, uh, the registration, um, yeah, 
national registration systems of Mexico, the Philippines, <laughs> Turkey, and Lebanon had serious data breaches. Um, South Africa had their driver's licenses database breached. And so they're not paying attention to security. And if you, as World Bank, as people from the World Bank, or as people working on poverty, if you're going around promoting additional data collection, and it's not going to be kept secure, and I guarantee you it will not be kept secure unless you invest vast amounts of, uh, of money into it, entice engineers from Google and Facebook to leave those firms and go and help build these secure stores. It's not going to happen. And that's why we're going to end up in this world where people don't trust. So I, I view security as like a hygiene factor. It's like if, if you don't have that, then definitely you're, you're, you're kind of off the map, right? You're, um, people immediately will lose trust. But I also see other things being built on top of, on top of a basis of, uh, of, of having that security where, you, where actually even with it, you still don't have trust, right? Even with it, then people still don't trust that the data that is being collected and used is going to be used actually in their interests. And that's why, um, I don't know if you can see it on the, on, the, um, uh, on the picture, when we talk about trustworthiness as the way of, of addressing this fear, we talk about ethics as being an, an important part of that. Everybody talks about data ethics in a kind of uh, hand wavy kind of way, but, but it's important to have those kinds of principles there. For me, the, the bits that get neglected are actually the other two E's there around engagement and around equity. Um, so it comes down to this thing of, of, are you collecting data that is going to be useful for me and used in my interests? Can I as an individual or, or us in this community actually trust that this data is going to be, is going to be put to work for us? rather than for you. Um, and where we see backlashes, it, it's not only about security and security breaches, which I think you know, people should get more upset about, actually. Um, but it's also about this deep-seated thing of who's benefiting from this and why wasn't I involved in these decisions? Um, and that, and that piece about equity and fairness in the way in which data is being used, I, that, that, I think, is the, a challenge that really needs to be addressed. Yeah. Exactly. And so last week, the World Food Program uh, announced a partnership with Palantir. Uh, Palantir is a, um, a debt exploitation firm that was essentially set up with CIA money. Um, and most of their, uh, their uh, clients are government intelligence and law enforcement agencies. They, they help build uh, uh, New Orleans' predictive policing system, for instance. But occasionally, Palantir gets involved in well, this sector, because they know it helps their image. Um, and WFP, when they announced that they were going to work with uh, Palantir, uh, WFP says, well, we have so much data, and you know, we, we, we want to be like Uber uh, and be able to analyze this data. And it's like, who wants to be like Uber? <laughs> Uber doesn't want to be like Uber right now. They've been drawn through so much mud for all of their mistakes. But, the, but WFP says, but we can do this stuff, too. But in whose interests? To whose benefit? But they don't feel like they have to account for that because they don't have to talk to their beneficiaries around it. Instead, they're talking to the world media. Look how cool we are because we can mine this data too. Mm -hmm. And by the way, last year, there was an audit of WFP system that found that they had security problems. But I'm sure they've solved those <laughs> before they started mining. Right. So this is um, bringing, that, bringing that all together. So we talked about how you know, we, we have this kind of shared vision about uh, using data for, for good, but in ways that are trustworthy um, and don't harm people. I, I suppose for me then, the, the message that I would really like to, to drum home is be thoughtful about the data infrastructure that is being built. Um, so, you know, recognize that when data is being collected, that you are building that data infrastructure and who has access to it, who decides who has access to it is important. And it's not just a data infrastructure for, you know, for, for World Bank and for policymakers to make use of. It's an infrastructure for businesses and it's an infrastructure for individuals. It's an infrastructure for communities. Um, and making data as open as possible means engaging with those people and those organizations to ensure 
ensure that it's beneficial for them too. Um, and, doing, and that engagement is one of the ways in which we can build trust and make sure that we don't have this kind of real backlash that, that means that over the long term we stop being able to use, it, and stop being able to rely on really high quality data. And just for my closing bit, to build on Jenny's great example of roads, you, you have an opportunity to shape the rules of the road around the world. Yeah. I would argue you should have been doing it for a long time to date, but you can now to say, look, if we, we're going to take your data, if we're going to negotiate you with, uh, about building a new system, require law. Over 100 countries have data protection law right now. Kenya is working on theirs. Um, Uganda is apparently very close to signing it. Uh, the president is very close to signing it, but none of us have actually seen the law. But um, there is momentum around these laws you can push these laws over the, the, the finishing line and make sure the frameworks exist, they're fair to people, and that you can plug into those frameworks to make sure that your access is lawful and fair. So this is why I'm here, and hopefully I'll be here in fe February 12th next year, <laughs> to see what progress we've made on this together to say that these things matter to people everywhere, including the people in this room. In order to make this fair, we should ensure that there are governing rules of the road. Great. So that's all that we had planned. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, to be honest, I really was expecting a more fierce <laughs> debate, but I'm really glad you ended up having such a friendly conversation. I guess even though this data openness and data privacy protection seem to be at opposing and there are actually two elements on like the two sides of one coin now we can't go with one without doing something right about the other yeah. so I, I i'm really glad that uh, you made it clear these two things need to coexist but we need to find the best way to manage both um, as I said, this is really about a discourse among the two of them, but also between them and all of you. So let's really get that part of the conversation going. I want to thank all our long-line viewers who have been actively participating and uh, have sent me quite a number of questions. So I will throw some of those questions out while really giving you a chance to come over to the uh, microphone if you would like to share some of your insights and ask any questions to our guest. So um, one of the questions from our online users is, the panelists are talking about two different kinds of data, private companies profiting or helping the surveillance state vis-a-vis -vis public data held in a trust by government. Can you comment on these differences? We've heard several examples of private misuse of data. What about public good data? Any of you would like to start first? Um, so we split our time 50-50 going after companies and government. <laughs> um, and I could give you uh, example after example of governments abusing the data that they collect, or governments having secret uh, laws that aren't on the books that allow them to exploit the data even more so. And it's, data exists in a very hostile environment. Uh, data is brought into the world because of that hostile environment. That is, somebody had the clever idea to create that data in the first place. And odds are that clever idea wasn't necessarily in the interest of the individual. It was in the interest of whether it's the company or whether it's the government. And it's a lot of effort, a lot of money. And so that's why there's an interesting discourse trying to emerge right now around good ID, for instance. Can we build good ID? And I would love to see good ID. It's just, I'm a warrior of all the bad ID laws that are out there. And they have so much political momentum behind them because of the similar objectives of the, if you want some fighting, some similar objectives of the open data world, which is utility. We want an ID system that will resolve immigration fears, national security fears, uh, counting people fears, um, and educational disbursement. We want an ID system that can do that, but you can't build a good ID system that can do that. But that's the reality of government. Government wants to build multi-purpose, open systems that are allowing others sure. to plug in and play, including yourselves. And so the, the questioner is entirely right. Sure. 
And Jen. I, I wasn't sure whether the question was trying to highlight where, asking us to highlight where there were some public good uses of, of data, oh, yeah. uh, it, which, I mean, I, I think that we have to recognise, sure. like, like the, 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 there are both. And in fact, you know, the, the people online haven't seen the, the initial conversations here, which brought out things like um, being able to predict crop yields, the, being able to understand where new energy uh, infrastructure was needed, being able to understand where, you know, what, what kind of transport infrastructure to supply, uh, all of which were really lovely examples from the lightning talks um, about the way in which uh, sometimes private, sometimes public domain data could be used in order to help planning and help inform the ways in which we, we operate. Thank you. Um, before I go to another question from online viewers, let me give the floor to my colleague, Jeremy. Uh, thanks, Haishan. Uh, th thanks very much for a fascinating conversation. A couple of questions, sort of one more for Gus and one for Jenny, but you might have perspectives on both. Uh, so Gus, is it the case that we're seeing a younger generation that seems increasingly uh, uh, sort of less concerned about private data, comes with different values, different expectations, uh, and is that a sort of barrier and is that a problem that, that you see and recognize? And then to Jenny, uh, you know, despite conversations like this and despite the sort of work of, of Privacy International and people like Gus, it seems like the level of understanding of some of the risks of AI, both amongst the public and amongst sort of policymakers, is still very low. What more you know, can be done through education, through discourse to really sort of raise that education because you can't sort of start at the legal level, you've got to have that public sort of demand. The, um, all the survey data I've seen on the question of young people actually shows that young people uh, are more concerned about protecting their data than the more problematic generation, which is the older generation, who just has no idea um, and so are posting uh, pictures of their kids on Facebook without ever thinking about what that means for their kids, whereas young people do get this. The, uh, the challenge for young people, according to these studies, so I'm just basing it on these studies, is that um, they have too much confidence in their own abilities or too much confidence in the companies to protect their interests when push comes to shove. And nobody is really grasping, and that because we all still think about privacy around the data we knowingly give. Nobody's thinking about the data that you just don't know you're giving. And I think raising that above the level, to link to your second question, that's the true challenge we have, whether it's around AI or whether it's around metadata and all these other types. The thing that I, I would just add, add to that, just to expand the, the question a little as well, um, is that we do have to recognize that our norms will change over time about what is what seems to be acceptable to us and it also changes based on place right different communities different environments have different um, feelings about the way in which data is used and, and I think that having any kind of like blanket assumption mm -hmm. about this is something that everyone feels comfortable with and this is something that that no one feels comfortable with is, is just not the case which is why I hammer on this kind of engagement as being really really essential with the communities that are are affected by the way in which data is being used so that you can hook into those norms and make sure that you're not not upsetting it um, I think in terms of the the, the, the question about level of, uh, of understanding of the risks of data, I, th I think, it, again, <laughs> that again depends on where you are. If, you, if you're in the UK, uh, practically every article <laughs> that's about AI is actually about the, the harms and the bias and the, and the risks around it. But in different places, that, that's, that's not the case. Um, what, I get, what I get worried about um, a, a bit from some, com some conversations that I hear, particularly around data, uh, data capacity building um, is that we tend to focus on uh, data scientists yeah. as the uh, as the people that we need to build capacity for right it, it's all about um, making sure that people can can use data more effectively when actually I think we need more data uh, critics yeah. or, or data ethicists um, and people who can who can bring that kind of view <laughs> and, and actually training around that and understanding different kind of governance models and and some of these pieces around how do you engage with mm -hmm. communities how do you make sure that you're communicating the way in which data is used? Um, I think that, that those are the kind of skills that we also need to build up, as well as those more hard science-y yeah. type ones. Yeah. Yeah. 
very important point. Um, I, I would just be fair to give another chance to the online uh, viewers' questions. And this one is from Jolti Kadaki. Um, the question is, health data cannot be anonymized, but is incredibly valuable. What are your suggestions on how to use this? Not easy question. Um, that's, that's, I, but fortunately, the medical world has a rich history of debate and deliberation and processes that are applied to questions of medical data um, and health data for research purposes. Where it gets more dodgy is first, um, not necessarily health data, but data that's representative of health. Uh, that might not re reside in your medical file, but might reside elsewhere, mm. and how that is used, it becomes highly problematic. And Jenny's far better expert on these questions than I, uh, so I'll, I'll punt at your way. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I think that this is one of the, health is one of those places where we can both see the real, real benefits and see the, the real, real risks because it's incredibly personal, incredibly sensitive information. And what we're seeing in terms of a trend, as you were saying, is, is actually more and more data from other sources being used in order to make, uh, have implications about our health, whether it's that um, picture of somebody smoking or drinking, uh, the number of the, the way what we're buying at the supermarket, um, analyzing social media uh, feeds in order to de detect depression and suicidal impulses. You know, these are all um, these are all new challenges. I would say around the way in which health data is is being or, or data is being used in order to inform health decisions. And I think that the same kinds of principles um, apply. You know, uh, having that communication with patients, with patient groups, with the with the people who are actually affected um, is absolutely essential in order to know where our norms need to be. Um, and I don't think it's the same in different, in different cases. There, there are some people who are incredibly, uh, incredibly passionate about their personal health records being shared for, uh, for medical research purposes because they've got some very rare condition that they don't want other people to have to suffer. Um, and we have to recognize that the impulses can go both sure, ways sure. Um, and, and, and find the ways of rewarding and incentivizing um, some but of a that. A great modern example of how we can still do it wrong is uh, there was a hospital uh, in London that decided it wanted to do research on uh, on well, you basically we use AI to research uh, admittance data to identify kidney failure uh, as soon as possible and um, Google's DeepMind got involved and so the hospital basically handed over all the admittance data to Google Deep, Deep, to DeepMind for this analysis and then DeepMind subsequently sent all this data to Google in the United States and so it creates th these challenges that I, I don't like the, I think the hospital did not act in accordance with understood procedures in the, in the medical profession around consent uh, and subsequent research and use of data. And so it became a, it one of those first examples of AI having been highly problematic. I, I'm not sure that the story that you just told around the way in which that data went to Google is the right story okay. I, I actually on, on the ground. But there are some really important issues around that in terms of the, uh, and that particular arrangement. Um, for me, around the exclusivity of that arrangement. So it, why was it that, that DeepMind was the only organization to benefit from, from that data? And when you're just kind of reinforcing their the, their, um, their views, right? It, what, what are the other organizations that could have taken, taken advantage of that? And how was that decision made? Um, uh, I think are important issues with it, yeah. Thank you. Um, my name is Nirmal Bhagabati. I'm a scientist at the World Wildlife Fund here in Washington, DC. And my question has to do with uh, essentially democratizing access to data. So in a lot of places where we work, there are, for example, infrastructure projects, you know, roads, mines, pipelines, seaports, yeah. sometimes funded by multilateral, sometimes, you know, by governments and other sources. But in the end, often by the time these projects have been uh, approved and funded, 
the most you can do is to try and, and mitigate the worst social and environmental impacts of them. Right, right. Often, local civil society does not have a seat at the table. And a part of that is unequal access to data. They do not have the types of data that governments and the World Bank and others had in making those decisions. And even if they had had access to the data in the early stages of decision making, they cannot hire an army of data scientists and data professionals to do that kind of analysis. So what can we do to level the playing field? I mean, some of it may be pretty low tech, uh, but I wouldn't say low tech in the implementation, but in the sense of a user accessing a platform like Global Forest Watch or what have you to get a quick sense of what's going on. But a lot goes into that, but how can we make sure that these impressive data initiatives that the World Bank and others are taking on are not merely widening the data gap between the data haves and the have-nots. Thank you. I, I think that's a really, really important point. Um, so, so one of the things that, that we're really keen on at, at ODI is recognizing collaborative models and, and community models for actually generating data, as well as the, the ones that kind of come from the, come from the top down. So we did a, a project, a couple, of, supported a project a couple of years ago called Heathrow Air, where it was uh, putting um, air quality sensors around Heathrow in order to equip the community communities to make the arguments about the, whether or not a, a third runway should be built. Um, so I think that there are important pieces around supporting those kinds of um, collaborative data collection and maintenance kinds of, of projects so that communities themselves get a, equipped mm -hmm. with that. And I know um, GPSDD is, is doing some, some really good work around, around supporting those. But I think we also have to recognise it precisely, as you say. Um, you know, who is it that has the, has the, the power? Who, who is it that has the capability and the money and the resources and to buy the, the data scientist's time in order to analyze, in, uh, in order to analyze data? Well, it's obviously the people that have the most data or, already. And so where do we need to, where, where the, the role is for, for equalizing that is to invest in those smaller organizations, in those, in the, whether it's businesses or community organizations to help them get up to the same kind of level and to pool their expertise so that so that we can work together and, and make that uh, make that work better but we don't do that by stopping access to true data that we, we do that by supporting their capability I don't know if you just just a quick shout out uh, just thank you very much I just want to follow on uh, what you just said uh, I want to have a shout out to data kind who actually is joining us and they have a booth in the atrium. It's, it's a data scientists coming together to volunteer their time, their skills to help different smaller um, group of actors to, to really make use of the data they have and generate some really actionable insights. Um, so I, I think we need more of that, uh, but definitely. I, and, and I agree, but the, uh, I mean, people volunteering their time is different from an investment sure, sure. into it. I, so I, 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 I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. I just yeah. realized <laughs> that before we get there, there are people already really. Yes. Um, another question from our online users. Uh, I also want to give the time to anyone here who wants to ask the last question. Please come forward and be prepared. Um, similar to what has been done with environmental and social issues after some controversial projects in the development sector, should we set up a clear data safeguard framework for international organizations and the project they support? And what would that look like? Yes. <laughs> yes, and yeah. let's figure that out. Yeah. You operate in a very awkward environment where legality and application of law and the special protections you have all create these strange, strange mix of obligations and non-obligations at the same time. And yet your influence is huge, yeah. Yeah. much more than ours. Um, and so we can work together to make sure we have the legal frameworks, build the right systems, have the right safeguards, beg Google and uh, Facebook engineers to come and secure these systems everywhere. That's absolutely, February 12th next year, let's be <laughs> yeah. reporting back. Good, good, good. Jenny, I don't okay, have maybe last question from the audience. Yes. Hi, my name is Sujati Imani. I'm a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow, um, now working in government uh, background in chemistry and entrepreneurship. So my 
uh, work right now. Actually, I'm looking at a lot of open science and trying to understand how we can share data from a scientific perspective to increase transparency, to actually engender more trust in science from the public. And I wanted to understand your perspectives on how privacy plays a role in that, and maybe even from the data standards and ethics perspective, do we have to look at different industries or different uh, uh, uses of science or uses of data that should be kind of more allowed, more flexible than others? I mean, some science, health data is different, um, but uh, other scientific data, you know, anonymization is not really an issue, but maybe how a particular area of the world might want to use that data yeah. might be an issue. Uh, can you start on that one? <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, so, uh, so open, open science, uh, open scientific data, and, and data that comes out in scientific projects, I think, is is part of that data infrastructure that I was talking about. What I often see with science, with um, data that comes out of uh, science work, is that it it can be a one-off thing, right? It can be a one-off collection, and and, and that you, you then have some some data that can be useful for a for a period of time, and be reused for some particular purposes and, and that's great um, but when we're building really strong data infrastructure we want data that is regularly collected that is that it's reliably accessible and that it's oriented towards those that kind of reuse which might not be the same kind of uh, targets that, that, a, that a scientific project a research project might be aiming for from that data and that's I think the, the kind of um, circle that we have to square with 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 data from from uh, from research and, and open access kind of, of data how do we make it so that it, it, it is re more reusable in more circumstances rather than just in that particular project um, and what is it that you needs to be embedded in the researchers mind while they're doing while they're doing that collection and and making it available so that it has that longevity or or do we just forget about that I mean we, we, we don't have to have every single piece of data being reused in every single way that we can possibly think of it um, um, so, uh, again, it, it's about being conscious about those decisions that we make and investing the time and the effort and the resources in where it's going to really have that, that longer term uh, kind of impact. Good. Thank you very much for your question. Um, okay, I got to ask the last question. Um, this discussion reminded me just last week uh, when Davos was going on and I happened to be in a nearby city in Burns and talking with some bilateral donors to think about what are the ways that we can increase you know, sustainable, better financing for data. And I was very happy to follow what's going on in Davos and it turns out the Japanese Prime Minister in his special speech towards a new era of hope-driven economy stated that given that they are taking up the, the G20 leadership this year, he said, um, as always at this summit, summit, we're going to discuss a range of issues, but today I want to focus on two big issues, only two. First off, I would like Osaka G20 to be long remembered as the summit that started worldwide data governance. The time to do so is ripe. Um, it will be digital data driven, driving our economy forward. We had better act now. We must, here it comes, on one hand, be able to put our personal data and data embodying intellectual property, national security, intelligence, so on, under careful protection. While on the other hand, we must enable the free flow of medical industrial traffic and other most useful non-personal anonymous, anonymous data to see no, board, no borders, repeat, no borders. The regime we must build is one for DFFD, data free flow with trust. Anyway, since you have been pushing for what our conversation will look like in one year's time, I also don't want us to repeat what we're registering now, but rather really see that we're moving on to a path of solutions. So I will ask you two to quickly respond. What are the two things, if you are given the, the opportunity to influence this agenda in June at G20, what are the two things you want them to accomplish to have a, some breakthrough so that we will be really indeed on a path of a, a balanced open data and data protect, uh, protection? 
I'm highly cynical of that approach, unfortunately, okay. uh, because the data governance is a good term, but when you, you put it alongside the flow of data in the context of, say, G20 or trade discussions, it tends to be that trade must dominate and these questions around national considerations like national constitutional frameworks, Japan's new data protection law, these things should never get in the way of trade. And that type of discourse is a, a gross distraction from the, we need a world where people have protections. We have international human rights frameworks for 70 odd years that have promoted that. It's just, it's not getting the same traction as this dichotomy that's now being painted because governments want to lessen uh, controls, whether it's, yeah, the controls over data, so they can allow the data to flow. Jenny. So the, the way that I would, the way I would see it is, again, mapping to that data as being infrastructure, kind of, kind of uh, argument that um, some of the infrastructure that we build, some of the physical infrastructure that we build, we build across borders. We have, this, we have rail lines that um, have the same standards that mean that a train can go across borders, and that is incredibly useful. Um, but, so we need to have that. I do think that it is worth, in some places, having global data standards for particular types of data, um, having global collections of, of uh, a collection of data and global identifiers, and so on. Those are really important for for helping us to not only trade but also just have communication with each other, which I, which I think is, is part of it. But the the rules of the road, as you are saying, the the rules of the road I think we also need to have these common understanding that there are that, that our human rights map onto our digital and data rights and that they we have those same that same kind of assertion of that uh, of a of a rights framework around our data rights within that within that global data infrastructure so it's like I don't think we should be putting up lots of walls around the flows of, of data. I share your concerns, but we, we should be addressing it in the same way as we do other big multinational infrastructure projects. Thank you very much. I, I know you have a, you doubt that proposed approach to this issue. But at the same time, I wonder whether the world is in desperate need for a really well-organized political process to bring the private and public sector together, the legal and technology sector together to come to terms with some of the fundamental universal values that need to apply it everywhere. This is not just about data, it's about how the technology is being applied to our lives. So with that, uh, let's give the, our guest speakers a round of applause and also all our, all our online um, participants and those of you who are here. Um, this concludes our morning session. Um, we start with lunch, which is served in two locations. One is you cross this whole way through the globe to the front foyer, that's where breakfast was served, and also here in the overflow room on the, on the site. At the same time, we also have this private public collaborative uh, uh, event uh, uh, in room MC4, so 800 where lunch is also served. Please come back before 1.15 if you're eager to hear from our keynote speaker, Simon Rogers, the Google Google's data editor. So thank you all very much. Thank you. This is